everyone, and welcome to the Deschutes Public Library and Programming Travels in the Emerald Isles. I'm Laurel Westendorf, part of the Community Relations Team, and today we're hearing from community librarian and traveler Julie Bowers. Julie is celebrating 15 years with Deschutes Public Library, where she is currently a community librarian focused on children's services. Julie was deeply moved by the natural beauty and astonishingly visible history of Ireland during her travels there last year. Thank you so much for sharing your travel experiences with the community, Julie. Before we get started, I'd like to take this moment and talk about a novel idea. This year, as we move the novel idea of programming online, we appreciate more than ever the ongoing support to the Public Library Foundation. Thanks to the generous support, a novel idea has grown into the largest community-wide reading project in Oregon, bringing people across the country together to discuss and learn about each other through the lens of one book. The foundation is supported by generous donors, including the Oregon Cultural Trust, Lanza, Oregon Arts Commission, the Roundhouse Foundation, RBC Wealth Management, U.S. Bank, and Emmy Bank Advised Fund of the Oregon Community Foundation. The Bulletin, William Smith Properties, the Friends Organizations of the Deschutes Public Library, and over 300 individual donors. Thank you. In addition to a novel idea, the Library Foundation financially supports the library's youth initiatives, including summer reading, early learning spaces, and jackets. Please consider donating to the foundation and the important work that they are doing to secure the future of the Deschutes Public Library. You can visit their website at www.dplfoundation.org. With that, I'll turn it over to Julie. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Laurel. I'm really happy to be here. I was lucky to spend a week in Ireland last summer with my sister and brother-in-law. This is us. I fell in love with it, so much so that I began exploring how I could relocate. I'm excited to share with you a little of what was so appealing to me. We were there during the summer holidays at the very end of July. Europe experienced record temperature highs while we were in Ireland, but it was very moderate on the island. The weather was quite changeable. It was sunny and breezy often, but we also had rain, mist, and fog. It was occasionally very windy. I actually got blown off this boardwalk. We did visit the coast of Ireland, which many of the people we met recommended. However, we found it to be so much like the Oregon coast that we decided to spend our time elsewhere. It was funny, though, that even though it was gray, chilly, and windy, kids and families were eating ice cream and running into the water. The coast towns were very crowded that week. All the roads we experienced were congested and narrow. Our car was just a bit bigger than a golf cart, but again and again it seemed we were too wide for the lane. My brother-in-law had experience driving in Europe, so he was the only driver we insured. My sister and I, as passengers, had to learn to dissociate ourselves from the road so as not to increase the level of stress for our driver. That first day, though, there was a lot of swearing and possibly some vomiting. Repeatedly, we come upon something like this and think, I don't see how this is going to work out, but then it would. The native drivers were very patient and courteous and somehow would make room even when it seemed impossible. One of my favorite things about returning home was the width of the roads with shoulders. When I drove home from the airport on Highway 97, I could hardly fathom how generously wide the road looked. We spent a day at the Cliffs of Mar on the west coast of County Clare. You might recognize them from the movie The Princess Bride. They were featured as the Cliffs of Insanity Part of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince were also filmed there. This is a hugely popular tourist attraction with well over a million visitors a year. As I said, we were there during the summer holidays so the crowds were at their height. A local advised us to avoid the visitor center. We were glad we did as we could see the traffic snarls around it even a mile away. Instead, we saved money and really quite a lot of time and crowd stress by parking at a neighboring farm. From Guerin's farm, we took a quick trail to one of the highest points on the cliff and also got the bonus of making friends with this beautiful guy. 
From here, we could explore on the rough trail that extends the length of the cliffs. Perhaps you've seen pictures of these stunning cliffs before. They rise 700 feet above the wild Atlantic Ocean and stretch for 8.6 miles. It's a unique geological formation and a wildlife habitat, particularly for birds, including the Atlantic puffin. The cliffs are made up of layers of sand, silt, and mud that were dumped and compacted due to heavy rains about 300 million years ago. These layers form the solid rocks that make up the region today. Humans have inhabited the region for thousands of years and modern tourism began in 1835. The trail became progressively less crowded the further we got from the visitor center. Maher is spelled M-O-H-E-R. When the locals pronounce it, it sounds like mother without the the sound. Maher. Maher means ruins of a fort. It's named for a ruined fort that was demolished in the early 1800s. The materials from the ancient fort were then used to build the Mar Tower during the Napoleonic era. Mar Tower stands on the southern point of the cliffs, Hag's Head. If you took a guided tour, you would learn about the legends and folklore that are particularly rich around Hag's Head, or just ask anyone. Despite the heavy tourist population, the locals seemed eager to share their stories and knowledge with willing listeners. The trail was very rough and deaths occur most years. We talked about how it would likely be fenced off in a litigious society like ours. They do occasionally close the trail for very high winds, but it is windy and wild all the time. Plus what looks like solid ground might be a thin ledge with just the Atlantic below. Safer and more accessible options would be a ferry tour from the Atlantic or the visitor center. Um, and if you're lucky on a clear day from the visitor center, you may be able to see the Aran Islands. We visited Inishmore and it was absolutely the high point of the trip for me. With nine miles of land, Inishmore is the largest of the three hard scrabble limestone islands that make up the Aran Islands. We took a ferry from the village of Doolin. The Atlantic here is windy and rough. The ocean was choppy and it was a relief to get off the crowded ferry. On the island we enjoyed this glamping situation. The interior was kind of like a cabin of a small boat. There were also people tent camping in this area, but the winds were so high that folks were really struggling to set up their tents. There were also guest houses and B&Bs on the island. It was great to be there overnight. Since the last ferry returns to Doolin in the late afternoon and the first ferry doesn't arrive until late morning, we had many hours to explore while the island was mostly empty of tourists. Without the tourists, there are around 1,000 residents who speak Irish among themselves. There are fewer than 100 vehicles and just a handful of businesses, including the famous Aran Island sweaters. Here's Buddy wearing his. Inishmore is famous for the Iron Age stone fortress Dunangus, dating back to 1100 BC. It's the most impressive of its kind in all of Europe. The mysterious Celtic fort balances on the edge of a cliff 200 feet above the Atlantic, protected by the sheer drop-off. There was history on the island everywhere, with 100 miles of ancient stone walls, as well as early Christian sites. Back in West County Cork, we continued to be amazed by the accessible presence of ancient history surrounded by myth and mystery. This altar wedge tomb was built around 2500 BC and was repurposed by Christians as a mass rock at the time of the Great Famine. I was particularly taken with these beehive huts, which were probably inhabited by farm families of the early Christian period. They're crafted without mortar, and the stones have a downward and outward tilt so as to shed water. When complete, they would have a small aperture at the top, which could be closed with a single flagstone. The variety of the Irish landscape, ocean, cliffs, mountains, valleys, bogs, rivers, and lakes in close quarters and punctuated with castles, ruined famine houses, monasteries, and curious standing stones compose an irresistible whole. 
the combination of dramatic landscapes, stunningly green vistas, tranquil farms, cryptic sacred sites, rowdy taverns, and local traditions, sometimes shrouded in mist, stories, and legends, make for an unforgettable stay. Thanks for joining me. I hope you've enjoyed this armchair travel destination. Thank you so much, Julie, for your info on Ireland and sharing these beautiful photos with us. We hope to, that you get to visit again soon and that some of us get a visit too. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.